blown model I'm going to put up is I want to do things in, uh, in general equilibrium. I want to get the predictions out of this model for monetary policy shocks. Uh, I want to get testable implications that I'm going to go and take to the data to see how well they line up. Um, and I'll, the model also will nest the different paradigms. So it will nest the producer currency pricing and the local currency paradigm along with the DCP paradigm. So it's going to nest all three. Uh, and you know, we, the, so then we're going to use the data to basically decide which of these three is the best description of the world. OK. So in terms of building blocks, uh, it's a new Keynesian model. You need to have, you know, first thing is you need to tell, tell me what prices are, you know, that prices are sticky, right? So that's stickiness of some kind. Uh, we're going to have both uh, sticky prices and sticky wages. Um, then you kind of have to make a decision about, uh, you know, okay, Firms change prices infrequently, but how does how do you determine when firms change prices? The uh, the one that's most tractable and easy to play with is a Calvo assumption, where you know it's a completely random assignment of who gets to change prices. So we're just with some probability, you get picked on to change your prices. Okay, obviously that's not the best description of the world. People are actually making conscious decisions about when to do it, but in terms of implications, I don't think any of the implications I'm going to have here would be sensitive to that particular assumption. Uh, you could alternatively do it with some kind of a menu cost, and you would get very similar kinds of implications. Uh, then you have to describe what households and firms are doing. Um, you have to describe what's happening in asset markets, both domestic asset markets and international asset markets. Uh, and then you'd have to do... To, um, to, to say what's, what, what, how is monetary policy set. Uh, the good news is that this is a model uh, without cash, which I guess is a good description right now. Uh, and so this is monetary policy in a cashless world, which is the norm in, in, uh, in the, in, with these models now. It doesn't mean that there is no cash in the world. It basically means that there could be a, d a demand for holding cash, but you know, I can treat that as out, kind of as a separate piece of the model. I can solve for everything else without having to solve for that piece, and that piece will automatically adjust to satisfy everything else. So it's kind of saying that I'm just going to set it aside. Okay, it's not saying that literally cash doesn't matter. It's saying you could have cash. Now you could make an argument that you know you want to think of the world, but truly there's no cash, and that's fine too. But this is the Woodford uh, uh, models of basically cashless limits. Okay, so. Uh, what am I doing here? So this is a question that came up. I'm going to have home, which is a small open economy, H. So H is my, is my focal point. H is what I'm looking at, I care about. Uh, and H trades with uh, two regions, U, which you can think of as the US, that supplies the dominant currency, uh, and R is the rest of the world. Okay. Um, and the small open economy assumption basically means that all prices are, and quantities are in U and R are exogenous from the perspective of the small open economy. It's basically saying that you're so small that shocks that hit your country alone don't have really any effect on, uh, on the US or, uh, or the rest of the world broadly. Okay. So, um, do we start, as always, in these models? I want to model the household. Uh, the households, uh, that's their utility function. They get utility from consumption. Uh, they get this utility from supplying labor. VAR fees, the uh, inverse of the fresh elasticity. Um, and then C, in, in, the, in our open economy models, we have to define what the big C is. So if you're doing just a closed economy, you could think of one good and that would be fine. But the minute we have trade in there, you have to, you're going to have you're going to be consuming goods from different parts of the world. So I want to have, you need to have a consumption aggregator that uh, that combines goods produced domestically and goods that are imported from the rest of the world. So I'm going to put up a function here, and I'm just warning you that that's not a very insightful expression. It's that that's the consumption aggregator over there. Uh, it's you know, the standard open economy model would have a, if you know this, if you would be CES aggregator, constant elasticity of substitution aggregator, 
This is an implicit aggregator that allows you to deviate from a world where you have only constant markups. Um, this upsilon, Greek upsilon th term here, you can assume a specific functional form for it, and that's going to give you a source of variable markup. So why, is, why am I allowing this? This is the strategic complementarity part. So there are complicated ways, and there are easier ways of introducing strategic complementarities. This is the easier way. The complicated way would be to say that, okay, I have firms that have all finite size. Each of us are, is able to influence the market individually. So then either we, you know, we play Cournot, or we play a monopolistic competition with Cournot, or, with, or, uh, or sorry, sorry, we play Cournot, or we play, um, um, you know, we choose prices, one of those things. We can do one, of the, one or the other, Bertrand. Um, and then that gives rise to a reason why when, when I'm changing prices, I understand that it's going to affect the aggregate, my aggregate demand that we all face, and there's a strategic decision to be made. In this world where I have a lot of variables and a lot of moving parts and a lot of dynamics, it's going to be much easier, and with price stickiness, it's much easier to do this where I'm going to assume a functional form for preferences that gives rise to this, the same kind of variable markup idea uh, that, I, that I need. Um, uh, so Kim, Kimball is, a particular, is uh, one of the people who came up with this uh, particular form. And so I can continue to assume that there are firms that are of, there are a continuum of firms, so each of, it, each of the firms are measure zero, uh, but I will still get the fact that when I'm setting my prices, I care about the prices that everybody else is setting, and that if my price moves relative to the industry price index, I have a desire to, to I, would, I actually want to change my optimal markup. My optimal markup is no longer constant, okay? Given uh, that, you know, on these next two slides, I, I actually have a specific form for that upsilon function, which when you then solve and you can write out. Uh, given the time constraints, I'm just going to skip this particular part. If you care to read it, it's in the paper. Uh, but it basically tells you what the demand function looks like. So this is a graph here. Uh, the, the solid blue line is what the CES demand looks like. It's relative, this is relative output, the relative prices. This is your CES demand. This particular Kimball demand basically gives you a demand function that's uh, less convex or more concave. And so that, you know, that's what that thing looks like. But, you know, this is not a very, I'm not giving a very deep explanation at this point, so I would recommend that you look at the paper and the, and the, and the references in there. Okay, so households are uh, maximizing their welfare, the infinite horizon. You have uncertainty because there are going to be shocks in this world. Uh, and this is their budget constraint. Uh, this is their spending on consumption. This is the repayment of uh, any international debt that they hold. So the, oh, uh, here the assumption is that all of your international borrowing is in dollar terms, you know, consistent with what you see in the world. So you have uh, dollar borrowings that you have to repay at an interest rate of I subscript U, and that's the exchange rate in there, and so that's what you'd have to repay. B subscript T is the debt in terms of domestic currency that you hold. So, what, so let, me, uh, let me be clear about what I'm assuming for asset markets. I'm assuming that you have incomplete international asset markets. So the only thing that you can trade is a dollar bond with the rest of the world. You do not have a complete set of state contingent securities for international markets. Uh, while on the other hand, which by the way is I think a good description of, how, of, of the world and in terms of matching many features of the data. In the domestic market, we're going to assume that you have complete markets, and so you can trade a full set of state contingent securities within, within the country, in your own currency. Okay? Um, so BT is the amount of domestic currency debt that you hold. Uh, what are your sources of income? Your sources of income are uh, the labor income that you get from supplying labor, the profits that get rebated back to you uh, from the firms. Uh, you can acquire more debt, so that's another source of uh, income for spending. And you can acquire this whole state contingent set of, uh, of, uh, of domestic assets. And then the last thing over there is basically a, uh, it's at this point you can think of it as a, a dollar shock to your income. So you can think of this as if you were a commodity exporting country. 
And when the commodity prices go up, and commodity prices are all denominated in dollars, then that's the value that you get in, in rupee terms from exporting oil. OK? So that's, the, that's like a shock. You, you sell, there's a good that you trade with the rest of the world, and there's a world price for it. That's a dollar price. And, then, uh, and shocks to it are going to drive your, 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 the resources that you have. Yes, that's the sticky wage uh, thing. So, so the way we, uh, did I do that yet? No, so wait, wait a second. So consumption demand, I did that already. So yes, yeah, so you're looking at the, my choice variables over there. I'm choosing consumption, I'm choosing wages, and I'm choosing my portfolio positions, exactly. So we introduced sticky prices, and again, in the class, in these st style of models, we, the assumption is that each household is supplying a unique variety of labor. And you need that, because otherwise you would have no monopoly power in, in setting wages. Uh, and you get to choose, and you set, you, you set your wages a la Calvo. So again, very infrequently you adjust your wages, but you get to set your wages. This gives rise to uh, uh, wage stickiness. Okay, so you make the portfolio decisions. You're choosing uh, between holding Euro, uh, U.S. bonds and holding uh, rupee bonds. Uh, so what's the difference here? So you have the portfolio decisions. You, you, know, you, this, you have a trade-off. If I decide to save an additional unit, uh, that means I'm putting aside an additional unit of income for the future tomorrow, which means I have to give up less some consumption today. The amount by which I have to give up that consumption is going to depend upon the price level. Uh, and this is, remember, a dollar bond, so I have, to set, I have to pay for this in terms of dollars, so it also depends on the exchange rate. And that's just the marginal disutility. So this thing, and I bring the price down in the denominator, and I take the exchange rate up there, that's my what I'm giving up today to, buy, to save an additional unit in the dollar bond. Next period, why do I do that? I do that because in the next period I can earn this interest rate uh, and that affords higher consumption. How much higher consumption is going to depend upon what the price level is tomorrow and is going to depend upon what the exchange rate is going to be tomorrow. So that's the trade-off. The same decision for holding uh, domestic currency bonds except the fact that they don't have the currency floating around over there. Okay. So again, you're going to equate the marginal utility of consumption today to the expected marginal utility of consumption tomorrow in terms of real consumption units. Uh, and that's, what the, uh, that's the, that's the trade-off that you have. Now, if I take those two equations uh, and I log linearize it and I equate it, then you're going to end up with, for those of you doing macro, you will end up with an uncovered interest parity condition, which basically relates the interest rates in dollars to the interest rate in, uh, in rupees and to expected movements in the exchange rate. But for now, you don't need to think about that. OK, so there's a weight setting equation a la Calvo. Uh, again, you know, uh, these equations are never the most pleasant equations to stare at. Right? But uh, after you, you stare at it for long enough, you, get, you start appreciating it some more. Um, so think of the case when prices of wages, you could set wages flexibly. So suppose you could set wages every instant in time then the only thing you'd have is the stuff in the, inside the brackets would equal zero. You would equate your wage relative to the aggregate industry wage to the margin rate of substitution between consumption and leisure up to a markup. You would set it as a markup over your margin rate of substitution between consumption and leisure. That would be a markup. Now, now when you're setting wages infrequently, and you're not change, changing it every instant in time, then there's a probability delta W that the wage you set today is going to be in effect in the future too. So then this equation turns into some, it's like a weight and average of these deviations between these two should equal zero. So you kind of set your wage to be some weight and average of these margin rate of substitutions between consumption and leisure. So that's what this expression is over here. Um, okay, so that's, it. so that's on the household side. The production on the producer side, they, uh, the firms use labor and they use intermediate inputs. The standard models would usually simplify things and use on, make it only labor, but not use in, in intermediate inputs. Intermediate inputs are very important to me because that was one of the three pieces of the dominant currency paradigm, was to use imported intermediate inputs. Um, the intermediate input aggregator would have the same shape form as the C aggregator, so used, again, a source for variable markups. 
The labor aggregator is this uh, CES aggregator, which I guess I should have shown you before to tell you why you would set the markup of mu or nu minus one, but this is a standard labor aggregator. So it's basically firms use different varieties of input, labor inputs supplied by households. Households have some monopoly power in supplying that labor, so they set wages when they supply it to you. Um, uh, and, and firms also use intermediate inputs. The intermediate inputs they use is they, they use a bundle. They use a bundle of domestic intermediate inputs and of imported intermediate inputs. And how is that aggregated up? It's aggregated up the exact same way that overall C is aggregated up. Okay, so firms are then maximizing, uh, well, they be, they're going to, this is, this, is, uh, this is their profit. This is just their profit at any point in time for a firm that's producing a particular variety. They, their profit, they can sell in different markets. So they sell at home, they sell in region U, they sell in region R. Because of the assumption of market segmentation, which is a perfectly good assumption, you can set different prices in the different markets. And so this is, the, this is what you get from, uh, from setting prices in different markets and then depending on what exchange rate you choose. It's a little bit hairy, this expression over here, because you have to keep track. So my subscript, First, if, I look, if you look at my subscript, the first subscript, the first term in the subscript is always the origin country, and the second subscript is the destination country. And then the superscript is telling you what currency the price is invoiced in, okay? So PHIJ is basically saying for goods going from home to, to region I, where region I could be home, it could be U, it could be R. And the superscript J would again have the H, U, or R, depending upon whether the price is is um, the price I'm setting is in, in rupees or in dollars or in some other uh, currency. Okay, so this, there's stuff here that's getting covered up, but it's basically the marginal cost. My marginal cost of selling different markets doesn't depend upon the destination that I'm selling it to, so you're going to have that times the Y, where the Y is the sum of the total output that you sell. Okay, so you have uh, profits. Those are, those are the profits, and that's your marginal cost. Uh, this, this stuff is uh, fairly straightforward. This is just the input demand, the amount that I'm going to demand of these different inputs, both de uh, labor inputs and intermediate inputs. Um, now, the problem for the firm is not going to be, is going to be is static on the, on, the, on the decision, obviously, of how much to use of these different inputs. That I can condition on me deciding to produce a certain amount. Why? I know how to... Uh, I can decide how much of different inputs that I buy, of labor and of, of intermediate inputs in terms of domestic intermediate inputs and foreign intermediate inputs. But my pricing decisions are going to become dynamic. So my pricing decision is going to have a dynamic element to it because when I set prices, I'm going to change that price infrequently. Okay, so I, I told you that I would nest the different uh, models, the different paradigms over here, and I'm going to nest it by saying that a certain fraction theta i j of i uh, is, is, you, is priced in, in, uh, in the producer currency. So this is the Mandel Fleming paradigm. Again, remember, subscript i to j for goods going from country i to country j, superscript i is the invoicing currency in which I'm setting my price in. So this is saying that for the goods that are going, for this fraction of goods that are going from country i to country j, they're priced in the currency of country i. That's the producer currency, okay? The second one is theta ijj, which is the fraction of prices in the or fractions of prices of, of goods that are going from country I to country J. That's priced in the currency of country J, the destination currency. And the third is where you're pricing in the dominant currency. So regardless of whether I or J is in the U, in the, in U you are uh, going to set your prices in 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 uh, in the in in, your, in dollars. Okay. Um, do, any, anything that you sell domestically uh, and wages that you set are going to be sticky in the home currency. I mean, that's, that's not, there's, no, there's no choice there, which makes perfect sense. Okay, so you have the, the pricing equations again, for depending upon you know, which of the, which of the uh, you know, whether you're pricing in home currency or in currency of U or currency of R. Again, let's look at how you would, uh, to, to, to stare at something that would look a little familiar. When you have flexible prices, then, then this term in the brackets is equal to zero. Uh, and the price that you would set is a markup. 
over your marginal cost. All right? If you're going to set a, a rupee price, you're going to set a rupee price. That's a markup over your marginal cost expressed in rupee terms. If you're going to set a dollar price, it's going to be a markup over the marginal cost in, in dollar terms, expressed in dollar terms, uh, or in any other third currency. OK? So that's what this would be. Uh, again, because you don't change prices all the time, and the prices that you set today are going to be effective with the probability delta p every period, you have a weighted average again. You're going to set that weighted average to equal zero. You want to you want to set your weights. You want to set the price such that this whole expression here, which is a weighted average of the marginal costs, is going to equal uh, is going. You're going to set your price to equal some constant mark some markup over the ma marginal cost, but a weighted average of that thing. Um, Again, remember that the markup is not constant in this world. It's going to move around because of the demand specification that we had that's going to give rise to variable markups. OK, what about monetary policy? Monetary policy is, is uh, the monetary authorities are choosing the domestic interest rate. The domestic interest rate uh, that way they set is set by an inflation targeting rule. You could have a, a different kind where you have inflation and output. I don't think that matters that much. Uh, but you can have an inflation targeting rule like India does, which is keep it at some level with, with some, you know, 4% with plus or minus 2 bend. Um, there's some inertia in which you change, you adjust your interest rates. There's some, phi M is going to capture your sensitivity to inflation. How much, how aggressively are you going to respond to inflation? So that's the other piece over there. And the last one is just a monetary policy shock. The dollar interest rate evolves exogenously. Um, and again, because we're doing a small open economy, the exchange rate between the other two regions, R and U, is going to be taken exogenously, right? We're going to make sure, we're going to discipline it to match the data, but, but it, there is a process that, that, that links the two up. Okay. Yeah, given my time, I'm just going to skip this one here. Um, So just to give you a, a, a simple set of uh, predictions that will come out of this uh, to, under, to kind of tell apart producer currency pricing, local currency pricing, and dollar currency pricing, what this says is that if I looked at import price data or export price data for countries, uh, in the case of producer currency pricing, where everything is priced in the currency of the producing country, this is saying that if I looked at prices, say, let's look at prices in, in rupees, uh, and if I look at the percentage change in prices in rupees that go from India to I, so the US, uh, and if I were to regress that on the, to ex on the exchange rate, either the, dollar, the rupees per dollar exchange rate or the rupees per the rest of the world exchange rate, in the extreme case of fully full rigidity, the weights on those, the coefficients on those would be basically zero. It's, which is basically saying that if my rupee price isn't changing, then when the exchange rate moves around, my rupee price isn't changing. So that's just what that is. In the case of LCP, you would have the fact that the uh, price in rupee terms, remember now I'm setting the price in the destination currency. So I'm, so I'm an Indian firm selling. When I'm selling to the US, I'm keeping the prices sticking in dollars. When I'm selling to the rest of the world, I'm keeping sticking the rest of the world currency. Then my rupee price is going to move around with the exchange rate, but it's going to move around with the bilateral exchange rate. It's going to move around with the exchange rate of, the, of my currency relative to the destination currency. If it is DCP, then what this says here is that regardless of which, where I sell to, regardless of whether I sell to the US or I sell to the rest of the world, my own home currency price is going to move one-to-one -one with the home currency exchange rate relative to the dollar and not relative to any other currency. Right? So in that sense, there's, a bit, there's an irrelevance of other exchange rates, which is that what really matters for my pass-through into prices is the exchange rate of the rupee relative to the dollar and not so much any other currency. OK. Uh, so what is this, the DCP, and going back to the full-blown version of the model, but let's see what happens to uh, uh, what, what, this, what this environment gives you. So again, I'm going to contrast the three setup, the DCP, PCP, and LCP. 
uh, and see what happens when you have a monetary policy shock. So think of the following case. Suppose that uh, India were to uh, have a monetary expansion, which means that it cuts interest rates. Uh, what that would do is that in all three cases, that would cause the rupee to depreciate. Uh, as interest rates decline in India relative to the rest of the world, you're going to have a uh, you're going to have capital moving out of India to the rest of the world. That's a weakening of the Indian currency. They get an immediate depreciation of the exchange rate. There's not that much happening differently across that. You're going to get interesting differences in inflation for the reason that I said I told you way in the beginning, which is the fact that for goods for when it's DCP, which means goods coming from the U.S. are priced in dollar terms, and if those dollar prices are in the short run not going to move, then I'm going to get a big inflation effect in the U.S. Sorry, in, in, uh, in India. You're not going to get a, an inflation effect if it's, on the other hand, the LCP case. This is the terms of trade. The terms of trade here. OK, so now go back to, the, again, the first two slides that I told you. Uh, I told you that when the exchange rate depreciates, in the case of the Mandel Fleming paradigm, PCP, you're going to get a, uh, a depreciation of the terms of trade. And in the case of local currency pricing, you're going to get an appreciation of the terms of trade. So you're going to get completely the flipped uh, to uh, opposites of what you'd expect. What does the dominant currency paradigm give you? It tells you basically the terms of trade is very stable. It doesn't move much at all relative to the exchange rate. So unlike the Monday flowing paradigm where the terms of trade moves one to one with the exchange rate, here you get a very stable exchange rate. So this is a very testable prediction, which tells you that if I look at countries around the world, I look at their terms of trade, if I were to back out the, you know, the impulse responses of their terms of trade to monetary shocks, or if I just looked at terms of trade, you know, what, how, much, how stable would they be? So why is that in terms of just intuition? The intuition for it would be that, think of the case where I'm selling everywhere in the world in dollar terms, all right? And everything I buy from the world is in dollar terms. If those dollar prices don't move around by much in the short run, then the ratio of those prices is also not going to move around in much in the short run. And that's exactly what that is. It's just saying that there is not, there's not going to be movement uh, in the relative prices. So what does that mean then? That means that, th that unlike the Mandel Fleming idea, and an idea that's very common in the literature, that, or, and among policymakers, that when your currency depreciates, that you get this big kick in exports, you do not get the big kick in exports in the case of dollar currency pricing. Because again, if I'm thinking only of the US market, then the dollar, I've set my prices and the prices are not gonna change very quickly in dollar terms. So I'm not going to, uh, I'm not gonna end up selling more in those markets over there. So you do not get this expansion uh, in exports. What you do get is expenditure switching coming through imports. So unlike the LCP where you had no expenditure switching whatsoever, you do get expenditure switching coming through imports. So this tells you that because you know, the rupee price of goods that I'm buying from the rest of the world are going to go up, so I'm going to switch away from imported goods to domestic goods. So you do get that expenditure switching effect. So what this tells you is that the trade balance is mostly driven not by exports but by, by imports. So the trade balance can improve here, but it does mostly because you cut back on imports rather than because of having an expansion in exports. Now, this is an interesting uh, implication because there's, you know, in the literature we've, we've tried, to, tried to explain why is it that following large devaluations that you do not have an expansion in exports. So there's been a lot of literature that basically tries to address that thing, but why is it that you do not see an expansion in exports contrary to what the Mandel Fleming model would tell you? Uh, and this is basically saying that this would be very consistent with the with, with ADCP world. Now, I, before I finish, I absolutely want to keep like a couple of minutes to explain, to, to tell you that, you know, in this model, I've just assumed that you're pricing in one of these currencies, you're in, invoicing in one of these currencies, right? Now, obviously, that again is, is not a great assumption because you would, firms would choose which currency to invoice in. So I want to spend, keep two minutes at the end where I, where I talk about the invoicing currency. And if I don't, uh, please ask the question in the Q&A round. Um, here's a picture on trade. What this is saying is that trade defined as exports plus imports, all right? What this is saying is that I have a monetary expansion in, in India that causes the exchange rate to depreciate. Under Mandel Fleming, I'm going to get an expansion in trade so world trade is going to expand because I'm, given that everybody else is just fixed, my exports plus imports, the change in that is basically the change in trade. 
So I'm going to get an expansion in trade, but I'm actually going to get a contraction in trade in the case of uh, DCP. Why is that? The reason it is is because on the import side, the model, the, both those models work exactly the same way. Because the prices of goods coming in, in rupee terms is going to be higher, you cut back on imports. So that's true in both cases. But on the, in the Mandel Fleming world, you get this expansionary kick in exports. And that can be strong enough that you get an expansion in world trade. But here you get actually a contraction. More generally, what this says is that unlike the, the standard paradigms, in a world of dominant currency pricing, when the dollar becomes strong uniformly relative to every other currency in the world, something that we've seen recently in the last couple of years, you can have, it has a negative impact on, uh, on world trade. It's not the main reason, I don't think it's the main reason for why world trade is slowed down, but it's, uh, it tells you why cyclically you can have a negative impact on world trade. Okay, so we go and we pull some data for Colombia where we get some very nice detailed data, micro data. Uh, we know their currency distribution, again, heavy dollar invoices, both for all exports and for manufacturing exports. So let's start with the terms of trade. So remember here, so this is a cool picture because this is the Colombian peso relative to the dollar. And that's the commodity price. 